Hello. I guess everybody can hear me at this volume. Uh, so a bit about myself. Uh, like introduced, I'm a data scientist with IBM. Uh, my background is actually in mining engineering. Uh, I worked in the oil and gas industry for six years. Uh, did a variety of different roles, all the way from mine design, maintenance, to finally business intelligence. And that's where I kind of grew the love for using data in heavy industries, you know, uncovering all the patterns, all the trends that a lot of people were thought were just experience, but is actually supported by data and can be validated by data. So uh, my role in IBM have been heavily involved with heavy industry, natural resources, the mining industry. So I'm really happy to be here today to share with you a project that's really close to my heart and which is the real-time AI process optimization. So that is a very long title, uh, it's a mouthful, but it's very intuitive. It's about using AI techniques with real-time data to help operations find the optimal processes, to find the optimal set points. So with that, let's go into why did we think this project was even important? Why did we want to start this project? And optimization is not new to any companies. I think everybody is human nature to optimize. You want to do better in your role, you want to do better in your area. But what we find is there, there are some blind spots. So I'm gonna speak from my personal experience. When I worked as a mining engineer, I was given the data set of you know, mine plans, your production plan. And I was told to optimize the mine design so I can get the most production out. When I work as a maintenance uh, coordinator, then my role is to use maintenance data, um, failure records, and you know, OEM protocols to go, you should minimize the unplanned maintenance or unplanned downtime of equipments. So you can see these objectives sometimes contradict each other. Um, when you're in production, you want to go as many trucks on the road as possible and just push it through. When you're in maintenance, you're like, well, actually, hold on. I need to take that down for maintenance. So these are the blind spots that we find when you have abundance of data sources, when you have abundance of expertise with different types of areas, people start optimizing in silos. And you leave a lot of missed opportunities that are in these gray areas that are contradicting with each other, or it's hard to find that sweet spot. So that's why we think this advisor uh, that we are working on, this project, can help bridge the gap and open up all these silos. And what it does is, now with AI capabilities, with the ability to stream in live data, to do models that incorporate all these different thresholds and protocols and objective and priorities, you can now optimize something on an end-to-end -end level and not only just within the area you're working in. So with that, we have a little video of what this advisor actually does, the features. So I'm going to play that for you. Yes. Ooh. Oh. Can everybody hear it okay? So from the, from the video, it outlines kind of the major capabilities that uh, this advisor provides. And one is upset flagging, and the other is set point optimization. And why these two streams are critical is because that actually manages most of the time what a plant or a mine site or a series of refineries, the states that they're in. You're either in a normal state, meaning everything's running okay, and you're just trying to you know, maximize your production, find that extra uh, whatever unit that you're producing. Or you're in an upset scenario, and what I mean by upset is something that is critical, a critical asset is now in a suboptimal uh, condition. And how do you respond to that effectively to reduce 
the negative impact to your production. So if I emphasize on the upset response piece first, so first of all, you have to know, when am I in an upset situation? And so that is the first piece, the upset flagging. So when we call upset, I think if anybody is from the industry or work with kind of industry operation data, you know if you're working with Pi, OSI Pi historians, PhD or SCADA, there are alarms. You can set something, you know, your high highs and your low lows. So to, to be aware of when your thresholds are crossed. But we wanted something more robust. It's not just looking at one value, but really consider some of the other conditions around it so you can actually go, this is the kind of situation I want to be aware of um, in a timely manner or even give me some lead time so that I can prepare for it and take proactive actions. So one of the major parts of deriving this model is getting the targets right. So like we said, because we're not just looking at one tag data or one piece of trend or time series trend to see when does it cross a threshold. Now we have to understand what do they actually call an upset. So we work very closely with our clients to figure out when would you call something up suboptimal. And at that point, we quantify the symptoms using the different tag data, understanding the conditions around it, and we use that as our target set. And then comes the modeling part. Uh, we evaluated different types of models, all the way from decision tree, something simple, um, to random forest, gradient boosting, and even into the machine, oh, sorry, the deep learning, the LSTM, and the MLP. And of course, you have to evaluate um, what are these models producing, uh, which one is the best fit for the client. And of course, technically, or on a technical side, you have your precision and recall. You know, do I have a lot of false positives, or am I even catching the upsets that I want to catch? And in terms of business value, um, how much in advance can I actually give you this lead time? For example, if something is tripping and you give it five minute heads up, it's probably not enough for that operator to run back and do anything about it. So evaluating the value that these models can bring is one of the critical steps. So at that point, um, once we get the notification out, so one of the features that we have with this advisor is we can send a text to the operation users. And we can go, oh, there's a potential that this asset is going gonna, is gonna to have an upset. It's going to go into suboptimal state. At that point, they can decide on how they want to action to minimize the impact. So that is then the meat of this advisor is what can you do to mitigate some of these uh, upset conditions, how it impacts your production. So we use uh, mathematical programming uh, models. And what we want to do is incorporate all of these different data sets that previously we talked about, all these expertise from different areas. And we consider everything as a whole from an end-to-end -end process. So no longer are we optimizing at a silo per silo, not area by area. And what, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is acrobatics, so safe. <laughs> so what this, what it outputs is a very, is a production plan that you can actually now kind of see what are the set points, what are the levers you can take from end to end to really mitigate these, mitigate these negative impacts. So not only on an end to end perspective it's adding value, but also the accuracy. Um, working from the mind, I'm going to speak from experience, is when you're responding to upsets, usually you have to respond really, really fast. And what happens is you don't have time to do a lot of math or look at historically how some things have happened. You're really just, well, historically that's my average, I'm going to expect this, this, this to happen. Okay, let's try this out. So what this, mo this model, this layered model that we have the advisor is providing is also these added accuracy because all these, <laughs> um, this advisor is supplemented by these models that can provide a bit more detail on, it's not just factors that we're using or historical averages. Um, so in terms of value, it provides a bit more granularity and accuracy. And lastly is time required. Um, when you're trying to react to a plan, sometimes you are, you know, you're listening to phone calls and then you have to Sometimes people go, oh, yeah, this is coming back up. 
and then call back five minutes. Never mind, it's not up. So every time someone gives you a new piece of information, you have to redo your production plan. And usually what the client have shared with us, these production plans take around an hour to produce. So what this uh, advisor can do is create a plan in approximately three minutes is what uh, we have uh, our record so far. And um, what this does is in the matter of the 60 minutes that they used to, we can generate, can I do my math right? 20 different, <laughs> 20 different scenarios for you to compare. So you're not no, no longer, time is not the limitation of how good your plan is. It will be the different things you can actually try. So this here is just an illustration of kind of what is the, what is the recommendation we can provide. So we can look at a graph view, you know, um, when things are upset, how do we ramp it back up? What are the levers we're suggesting you to take? So this is really good in a response scenario, but we have also designed this advisor so it can give you a recommendation when you're in a normal scenario. And what I mean by that is you are, you don't need something to break for this to work. When things are normal, you can adjust your objectives and make it okay so everything's good can I what can I adjust to create another unit of production how do I manage my inventory better so you can put that in and it will also do the same thing in how do I adjust your levers so that you can achieve your operations objectives and all of this really is enabled by the different data that we have available to us. So as we know, there's production plans, your, your operations data, you know, your OSI Pi or any, any data source that you're working with, SCADA, PhD, and then your maintenance uh, records, as well as you know, some user inputs that you might have. So all this is required for this model to really um, add that value. So with that, I'm gonna pass the time to my colleague, Kostya, who's gonna talk about how he enables all this data ingestion. Okay, there's this one. And technical difficulties. <laughs> I got two. Yeah. All right, thank you, Crystal. Um, so my name is Costa Diskin. Uh, I'm solutions architect at IBM, uh, and Crystal and myself and a handful of our other colleagues of ours are, are working on this project together. Um, so as, as Crystal mentioned, all of those different uh, data points that are entering into the equation, there's a lot of it. Um, you know, if it's a plant historian, we're talking about hundreds of pieces of equipment thousands of sensors emitting uh, readings in hundreds of thousands volumes per minute per second um, there is a lot of information coming in our way there is no point grabbing this information linting it somewhere and then analyzing it later because um, what good would it be if we detected an upset and it's ha it happened 20 minutes ago or hours ago um, no point at all. So what we are doing here is uh, what's known as real-time analytics. Uh, and I want to uh, spend some time talking about streaming analytics. Um, so how many of you in the room familiar with this term? Just a show of hands. Okay, about 10%. So I'm going to define some things. Oh, you can't hear very well. Sorry. How about now? Better? Okay, so streams. Uh, stream is defined as a continuous, uh, infinite um, set of data that is being transmitted. A uh, set of tuples, we call them. And the tuple is defined, typed, and ordered set of attributes. So in the case of um, um, historian data, it could be timestamp, tag name and the value it's reading. Um, the key here is it's infinite stream. So it continuously come in our way and it never meant to stop. So our equipment at plant sites or uh, at operations will continuously be working and running and continuously be emitting this information. So collecting this information and analyzing it 
uh, live is the key here. So, um, there are a couple of uh, advantages and challenges with that. Uh, so, as I define streaming, um, it's a continuous stream of data that's coming our way and we need to analyze it. Um, uh, naturally, uh, what's called back pressure can be created, meaning that we have too much data coming our way and we're too slow to process it and, and analyze it. So uh, that, that's a major challenge. Um, different cloud databases can be at play in order to store data and surface it to the end user. Uh, that could become a bottleneck. Uh, different kinds of events such as weather changing rapidly or there is a maintenance that was scheduled and planned and then gets canceled. Uh, so those are uh, the challenges that solution in general needs to be aware of and needs to be able to adjust appropriately. Approaches that we considered and ultimately took is uh, mm -hmm. our solution um, architecture is monolithic. So it's a one monolithic block that comprises of a number of different tools that we used, but it's meant to be monolithic. Uh, model interface as a service. So the models that data scientists do create are being exposed and available to the solution as a service, as a RESTful API call, for instance, uh, or as a um, asynchronous call um, that uh, is, is being requested from the solution itself. Um, so in a way, uh, what we created is, uh, we, we're referring now as architecture as a service. We, we have a monolithic block that can be reused for different types of uh, solutions that we can offer to our clients. Uh, this slide here shows um, a reference architecture of essentially all the actors and players and technologies and methodologies that are at play for an advanced analytics solution. Um, you can take pictures of this slide. It's pretty busy. And uh, it's not the intention to cover everything here. Uh, but I would gladly take your questions um, when we have some time to socialize and mingle. Um, but I'm going to go back to streams. So on one end, we have uh, a bunch of equipment that produces data. In the middle, we have something that does real-time analytics. On the other hand, we have the end users, the operators, that need to consume those actionable insights that our solution generates. Um, there are a number of ways to surface those insights. Um, it could be uh, you know, tools like Tableau or data visualization tools can be utilized. In this case, we actually opted to develop our own application, application that was born on the cloud and lives on the cloud. It's a web-based tool that uh, can be accessed uh, both in browser and on users' uh, mobile devices. And it meant to be simple. It meant to be um, not busy enough uh, or not busy at all so that it doesn't distract the end users from the key information that application is trying to communicate to them. Um, and ultimately, um, the ease of use of that front end is one of the uh, fundamental differences that we're seeing because we kept it simple we actually see in a very good, uh, um, f uh, receiving good feedback from our end users. Because we can't actually talk about in depth of the solution itself, this slide here represents a hypothetical um, solution. Um, And you can also take pictures. I'm not going to go in depth into that because it's not a real thing, in fact. Yeah. So, so the vision, and uh, do I need to repeat the question or yes? OK, so um, from client to client, uh, data streams that are coming in into the solution will vary. So what is our approach to 
to train models accordingly and adjust. Uh, am I capturing the question correctly? Okay. So as one of the slides pointed out, we took approach of externalizing the models. So the scoring happens outside of stream. So models can be trained and deployed um, and accessible via RESTful APIs or externally accessible from the stream. All the stream does is it prepares the vector that is being passed into the model. Models will have to be worked on on a client's per client basis. So of course, every business is different out there. Conceptually, every business produces a lot of data. The data that paints a great picture about what the operations look like, what are the upsets that are coming up, and what are the opportunities that can be realized. So conceptually, the architecture is meant to handle any volume of data coming through it and calling external uh, data science models that have been trained and ready to score the data that is being created. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to defer to Crystal to talk about uh, model retraining. But of course, models are being retrained over time. So the more data we collect the, and, and the more conditions are changing out there, uh, conceptually, models will have to be retrained over time. Otherwise, we'll, they'll, they'll become stale. You know. okay. yeah. So I, the solution that we're working on does not have that type of unstructured data being ingested into the system. So I'm just going to hypothetically talk about what I would do if there was. So, and to, to repeat the question to the audience, so uh, our data, so the, the ingestion that uh, we talked about is, is very much uh, ready to be consumed by models. So it's either CSV or the tuples that are in JSON format or what have you. What if there are PDFs? What if there is a video stream that is coming in? Um, or, you know, any kind of binary stream for that matter. So again, uh, depending on the platform that you, be, you, you deploy in a solution like this, uh, if it's an IBM cloud, we have a set of tools to work with binary data such as video or image recognition or sound processing, et cetera, et cetera, like natural language processing. Uh, competitors would have a decent set of tools to choose from as well. Ultimately, when you expose, when, when, you, when you ingest binary data, you would also call an external API is likely to help you process that data. And what will come back into your stream would be very much JSONized information that you can work with already. So it will ultimately become a text of some kind. So if you have a video stream and you're trying to detect faces, for example, it will give you coordinates of a number of faces detected on, on the frame, uh, you know, potentially a range of, you know, age of people or their genders, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so, so the question is, can the uh, client, the business uh, representatives and the users of the tool make some adjustments and tweak the system? Uh, the project we're working on right now, most of the tweaking is done by us based on the feedback that we're receiving from the client. Um, generally, you ultimately want to end up giving them at least some kind of a way to adjust uh, how things being processed and, and, and what, you know, for instance, uh, you bring a new uh, piece of equipment online. You want to include sensor readings from this piece of equipment and somehow influence uh, models uh, by whatever that uh, equipment produces. So generally, yes, uh, you would open up certain uh, configurable parameters for the end users to tweak. Uh, in, in, in our uh, situation right now, it's mostly we collecting the feedback from the, the client and incorporating the findings into, into our models. So I do have to say that, to preface that, this project is under a strict NDA, so I can't disclose a lot of details, but it is a mathematical programming uh, model. So it is a computing power issue. It's, it's not really comparing to human mind. And right now, three minutes, depending on complexity in the data, it can go down or it can go up. If they want to increase the complexity of the model, 
you know, and want to consider an even wider end-to-end -end process, then maybe it will take five minutes if the client wants it to be. So I don't think time itself is a measure of success. It, it, one of them, but definitely is we just want to beat that 60 and create a production plan that's valuable. So yeah, it's not the one success factor that we're measuring the model on. Uh, so the question is, are we doing anything to reduce dimensionality of all the problems? So yeah, we did explore dimensionality, dimensionality of, uh, of the, yeah, thank you, reduction. <laughs> because actually with our client and you know, PI data, PhD data, we were actually provided with hundreds and thousands of tags. And you have to do feature engineering and feature selection to properly understand. And we also explore methods like PCA and all that. Um, can't really go into detail, like I said. But yeah, it, it is being explored, and it must be because of the complexity of the problem. Yeah. So yes, we do see that problem. Um, uh, it's it's not necessarily about clients being out. It's 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 about this, the the size of the operations itself. So uh, you know those facilities are rather big, and their devices are connected via internal uh, whatever their network uh, uh, equipment is. So there are a bunch of uh, switches and and cabling involved, I'm sure. It's not just Wi-Fi that, uh, you know, there is being used over there. So we, we are actually seeing uh, tuples coming in out of order. So for example, there is a reading um, that came in that's, you know, uh, time stamped at uh, midnight. And then a few minutes later, something else shows up that was time stamped at 11.55 uh, p.m. Uh, you have to adjust, uh, you have to actually build in some smarts into the system to, to deal with those kinds of delays and latencies. Uh, to complicate matters far further, there will be uh, certain tags that are coming from historian systems that are human-generated tags, meaning there, there's a lab that takes a sampling of something that uh, you know, they, they're supposed to take sampling of. And those, those uh, readings can come in uh, and write out and correct, and then get adjusted or corrected hours if not days later. So all of those things need to be taken into the account by both modeling as well as the data ingestion pipelines. Uh, how are we doing it exactly? Uh, again, the NDA was mentioned, uh, so I, I can't really uh, elaborate on that in depth, but you definitely have to think about those kinds of things and it, it, is, it should be mentioned as a challenge and I should have pointed it out that uh, just by by virtue of how data is being created, you will have to deal with it being not perfectly aligned for you to work with. This is actually five months. Five months. Uh, yes, um, about, yeah? Since March. Since March, so a little bit more than that. Uh, but uh, yeah, m modeling um, stream as well uh, versus our uh, application architecture stream and actual solution. Uh, solution itself, I think we started, um, yeah, right around March, April. Yeah. It's not very big. Uh, I mean, <laughs> am I allowed to reveal the number? Uh, I think what, uh, about under 10 data scientists, uh, and under 10 uh, developers. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. Uh, there is no downtime. So we are pushing updates to, to the system essentially almost live, actually live. Um, and generally because it's, it's modular be behind the scenes. So it's very, very highly modular. But as a solution that we, we are planning to introduce to the market, it's, it's going to be a monolithic solution. So it's like, I'm going to give you an example. If you ever seen uh, Krispy Kreme's donut making machine, so it's a monolithic uh, architecture, but it has a bunch of different components within it, right? So it cannot function uh, separated, but uh, nonetheless, it, it, it has a bunch of modules inside. So I'll, I'll start and then I'll pass it on to you because it, it's way out of my alley. So clearly, uh, we, we're getting all the information in, and one of the streams that we're processing is, is saving all of that information. So we're retaining 
uh, historical data for a certain period of time, this data is clearly being used to retrain uh, the models. And it, for, for, for details, I'll pass it on to Crystal. So when one of these advisors go into production, it is mandatory to really understand how well your model is performing over time. And I think working with real-time data and process data, you kind of expect that someone does a calibration or someone decided to just, you know, change one setting and now instead of reading 20, you're now reading 40 and it just kind of goes on in this trend. So. So it is important that when we are, when it's in production, that it kind of tracks, you know, usually I get around 50 upsets a month. Oh, and then I can see it trending down, down, down to nothing. Is it possible that a plant have no upsets? Probably slim. So at that point, you would know that I need to probably revisit my data sources, retrain my model on more historic recent data, and just improve as the production goes on.